There are not many animatronics that can cause more submechanophobia than the Jaws shark animatronics. Be it the movie or the theme park animatronics, they are the stuff of nightmares for many people. So today, we will be exploring the evolution of the Jaws animatronics. Fast, fast fights. If you consider yourself part of the Duck Squad, go and follow us on Instagram. We'll leave a link in the description and the pinned comment. And tell us which is the best Jaws animatronic in your opinion. Bruce, Jaws 1975. Let's begin with the OG submechanophobia inducing animatronic, Bruce. This animatronic completely changed the film and the special effects industry. Not only that, but it terrified a whole generation, and the franchise became a classic that people would never forget. In the fall of 1973, art director Joe Alves designed the shark for Jaws, and here's where the Bruce animatronics began. Three full-sized, pneumatically-powered units were constructed at the cost of $150,000 each. They were collectively named Bruce, after Spielberg's lawyer. They each measured about 25 feet long and weighed hundreds of pounds. One shark, known as a sea sled, was a full-bodied prop with its stomach carved out. The other two, known as platform sharks, were each one-sided. One platform shark moved from camera left to right with the side facing away from the camera completely exposed. The other moved in the opposite direction. Once completed, the three sharks were trucked to Martha's Vineyard. The sharks were built by a legendary team overseen by mechanical effects supervisor Robert A. Matty, also known for creating other terrifying creatures like the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea squid. But despite the huge expertise of this team, the shark animatronics were a headache for the film's production. There are other reports that the sharks would sometimes slip off the platform and get tangled in a bed of seaweed. At other times, the pneumatic hoses that controlled the shark's movements took on salt water. The foam used as the skin on the sharks became bloated, and parts even corroded. Not only that, but the shark even sank once when it was placed in the sea, and divers had to go and fish it out. That must have been such an awful experience. Surprisingly, when the film was finished, the studio thought that the movie would not be successful, so keeping sharks in good condition was not a priority, and they just dumped the sharks in the back lot, and they rotted away. Thankfully, the shark's molds were saved, and a fourth shark was created. This shark could be seen by guests visiting Universal Studios Hollywood from 1976 to 1990 until it was again removed and abandoned in a junkyard. Fortunately, it was then saved and restored by the legendary Greg Nicotero, who later donated it to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Museum, where it can now be found. To know more about the history of these animatronics and the movie, check out our Submechanophobia video. Jaws Shark Mark I, Universal Studios Hollywood, 1976 to 1978. Jaws was, of course, a huge success, and so Universal decided that they needed to add it to their world-famous studio tour. And the perfect place to add it was where the Singapore Lake used to be. Singapore Lake was a human-made body of water with a scary house overlooking it. Its main attraction was a wave and smoke machine. But then, on April 10, 1976, on the banks of the former Singapore Lake, Jaws was first opened. This part of the attraction features a moving shark animatronic and many sets and pieces used on the actual film. The shark in the attraction utilizes a similar ride system first created by Bob Matty, of all people, for the Jungle Cruise attraction in Disneyland. The shark prop basically moves back and forth in a straight line mounted on a platform. The actual platform and shark sit in about 10 feet of water surrounded by two walls, sort of like a box. At a certain point in the show, it is triggered, and it runs its course. The official name of this shark is the Jaws Attack Shark Mark I, but unofficially, it is known as Carrot Tooth. And according to Joe Alves, this Carrot Tooth design came out of a meeting in which the studio execs wanted a shark with long teeth, like the poster but it ended up being more goofy than scary. Its giant teeth resembled icicles from the doomed avalanche attraction more than killer shark teeth. The body of the attraction shark is actually struck from the Bruce sea sled mold. The head is a caricatured re-sculpt of Bruce with less pronounced jowls. Bob Matty was embarrassed by the jowls of the movie shark, so these were toned down while an improved mouth was created, which allowed for greater water scoopage. This cartoon head would only exist on the Mark I shark. There were two color schemes for the Mark I. The first version was green with a pale blue belly. The second was bluer on top with an off-white belly. The shark also leaped out of the water at a higher angle than the next sharks would. The attraction also had the original film's props. But as we said before, after the film wrapped, the studio sold off nearly everything from the film as they had no faith it would turn a profit. 
and one of the props that was sold was the orca. The boat was purchased by a special effects technician, who restored the boat and later used it for sword fishing up and down the California coast. After the film was released and became a huge box office success, the studio approached the former tech and purchased the boat back from him for use at the Universal Studios tour. The orca was on display in the Amity Lagoon for all to watch and admire as the tram pulled away from the Jaws attack. Over time, the boat was neglected and forgotten. The pond wasn't that deep, and when the wood rotted, the boat sank in the shallow water, which flooded the lower cabin where the bunk's head was and the engine room. In 1996, Universal apparently tried lifting the orca out with a harness, and the hull was so rotted that the boat simply broke in half. Another original prop in the attraction was Ben Gardner's boat. This was featured in the scene in which Richard Dreyfuss went underwater to look for the missing fisherman when suddenly Ben's head appears. Ben Gardner's boat was one of the first things you saw on your right as you entered Amity Island. In 1981, the boat was repainted white and lost its original blue color as seen in the film. But then in May 2005, Ben Gardner's boat was removed for unknown reasons and binned in a skip during a major refurbishment of the area. The boat was the last remaining piece of authentic Jaws movie history featured in the attraction. Bruce 2 Jaws 2 1978 the next Bruce animatronic in this Jaws shark's evolution was Bruce 2, also known as Brucette. This shark came to life because after the massive success of the Jaws movie, Universal, of course, wanted to continue with the franchise and create a sequel to this classic. The studio wanted to bring back Spielberg to direct the sequel, so they reached out and asked him. But Spielberg turned down the offer. Producer David Brown said that Spielberg did not want to direct the sequel because he felt that he had done the definitive shark movie and he was not interested in working in another one. That, and Spielberg later added that his decision was also influenced by the problems the Jaws production faced. He said that he might have done the sequel if he hadn't had such a horrible time at sea in the first film. But this, of course, did not stop Universal from creating the sequel, and they began the production of Jaws 2. After an arduous and troubling 18-month pre-production process, full of script problems and director changes, the film was finally directed by Jeannot Zwart. To create the new shark animatronics, he brought in special mechanical effects supervisors Robert Maddy and Roy Arbogast. There were two sharks and an animatronic fin designed for the film. The first was the platform shark, also referred to as the luxurious shark. Special mechanical effects supervisors Robert Maddy and Roy Arbogast used the same body mold used for the shark in the first film. However, Maddy's design was much more complicated and ambitious than the first film. While the same body was used, a brand new head was made by sculptor Chris Muller, which made use of an all-new mouth mechanism, one which incorporated jowls to disguise the pinching of the cheeks that had proven to be a problem with the shark in the original film. The second animatronic shark was a full-bodied shark that could be pulled by boats, the same mechanism was used for the fin. These sharks were known as Bruce II, but on set, they were referred to as Fidel and Harold, the latter after David Brown's Beverly Hills lawyer. Now, we all know that Jaws was commended for leaving the shark to the imagination until two-thirds of the way through, but for this film, the director felt that they should show it as much as possible, because the dramatic first image of it coming out of the water in the first film could never be repeated. And so the filmmakers gave the new shark a more menacing look by scarring it in the early boat explosion, which worked out pretty nicely. Like the first film, shooting on water proved challenging. Scheider said that they were always contending with tides, surf, and winds, jellyfish, sharks, water spouts, and hurricane warnings. After spending hours anchoring the sailboats, the wind would change as they were ready to shoot, blowing the sails in the wrong direction. The saltwater's corrosive effect damaged some equipment, including the metal parts in the sharks, which, creepily enough, you can actually see in one of the sequences. Honestly, that makes it even more terrifying. No one knows where these animatronics ended up, but sadly, they probably ended up abandoned or even destroyed. Jaws Shark Mark II, Universal Studios Hollywood, 1978 to 1980. Now back to the Universal Studios Hollywood studio tour. Of course, after Jaws 2 came out, Universal knew they needed to update their Jaws sequence, especially the shark. For this update, the attraction shark was changed to look like the new movie shark. This second shark lost its carrot-like teeth and gained even more fake-looking teeth. The head was widened and its eyes were made entirely black. The rest of the sequence practically remained the same. The tram approached the town of Amity, where they could see a billboard announcing the town's annual July 4th celebration and regatta. 
As the tram went near the calm waters of the bay, they could see a fisherman to the right, his dinghy afloat and fishing rod patiently awaiting the day's first catch. The tour guide points out the fact that George, the lone fisherman in the water, is very brave for fishing in an area where a killer shark has been spotted. Suddenly, a huge dorsal fin heads in the boat's direction and begins circling. Before tram passengers have a chance to gasp, the fisherman's line is jerked backwards and he and his dinghy sink rapidly into the water, leaving only a circle of blood to tell its terrible tale. The tram quickly moved on, traversing a pier built decades before, along with the historic town. Again, unexpectedly and off in the distance, flotation barrels with shark bait lines tumbled into the water, the line dragging them across the bay and under the water by some massive force. A fragment of the pier is towed out to sea, collapsing the main section under the tram and leaving all aboard dangerously approaching the water level. Out of the water lunges the great white shark, its teeth deadly sharp and close, its size and intent horrifying. Luckily, the jaws are only threatening, not biting, and the unbelievable sea creature sinks back into the water. The tramload of would-be shark victims is saved as it limps off the pier. George the Fisherman managed to get eaten during this sequence for 24 years until he was later replaced in 2000, when the attraction received an upgrade. Also, since 1980, there have been numerous repaints and various dentures put into upgrading Bruce. Brucetta, Jaws 3, 1983. Jaws 3D is considered a terrible film in the franchise, and it's just that since the beginning of its development, it had thousands of problems. It had so many plot, writer, and even director changes. In the end, Joe Alves ended up being in charge of directing the film. Unlike for the previous two Jaws films, Jaws 3D would use models and small animatronic sharks that would be mixed with CGI instead of using full-bodied animatronic sharks. Jaws 3D tells the story of how a young great white shark finds its way into a sea-themed park and how workers try to capture it. But the facility's attempt to keep the shark in captivity has dire consequences. A much larger mother shark appears in search of its offspring. Now, during this time, there was a revival in the popularity of 3D, with many films using the technique. Cinema audiences could wear disposable, polarized glasses to view the film, creating the illusion that elements from the film were penetrating the screen to come towards the viewers. But what's interesting about this is that this film has what is considered to be one of the worst visual effects in cinema history. And even more surprising is that Alec Gillis, co-founder of Amalgamated Dynamics, was one of the people who worked on the scene. During this time, Gillis was working in a company called Private Stock Films while he was studying at UCLA. There, he was in charge of building a couple of miniature sharks. One of these sharks was built as a cable-articulated puppet with some RC functions. It took three or four puppeteers to control. The company owner asked if the team could automate it to save money, so they connected it to cams and speed control and cut out a couple operators. But apparently, the company was in financial trouble, and by the time they shot this, they couldn't afford any puppeteers. So that's why the shark looks like it's completely static. According to Gillis, this shot tends to pop up on virtually every worst list, sometimes even fetching the gold. Gillis shared this story on his Instagram a while ago, and this shows that everyone has to start somewhere. Now Alec Gillis is one of the most legendary names in the creature effects business. Even if the special effects of Jaws 3D have aged pretty badly, a lot of work was put into them, and we can honestly say that this film is so bad that it's good. The campy performances and the horrifying visual effects make it unique. Vengeance Jaws The Revenge 1987 Universal had not planned to do a fourth Jaws film, but in 1986 they were going through a bad time. So Sidney Scheinberg saw an opportunity and box office potential in creating the fourth film in this saga. This project was seriously fast-tracked so that it could be launched in the summer of 1987. And for this film, they decided to do the right thing and go back to animatronics. The person in charge of creating these new sharks was Henley Miller. Miller was convinced that these new sharks were going to be something that had never been seen before. And not only that, but he planned to have one of the sharks launched from atop an 88-foot-long platform made from the trussed turret of a 30-foot crane and floated out into Clifton Bay. In addition to this, seven sharks, or segments, were produced. Two models were fully articulated. Two were made for jumping, one for ramming, one was a half shark, the top half, and one just a fin. 
The two fully articulated models each had 22 sectioned ribs and movable jaws covered by a flexible water-based latex skin, measured 25 feet or 7.6 meters in length and weighed 2,500 pounds. Each tooth was half a foot long and as sharp as it looked. But despite all of these special effects, the film had terrible reviews and the audience hated it. Many people consider it the absolute worst movie of the franchise. After the film came out, one of the animatronic sharks was taken to Universal Studios Orlando and put on display in the Boneyard, where they exhibit many of their old props. It remained there for several years and started getting damaged and decomposing, until it was finally retired in 2008 when the Boneyard closed to make way for the Universal Music Plaza stage. But rumors say that the animatronic is still there in the back lots. Jaws the Ride 1990. Jaws is probably considered one of the most classic Universal attractions. The initial plans for the ride would take guests to the town of Amity to explore the sites where the shark had previously attacked. But then, things would take a turn, with the shark appearing on the scene and attempting to devour the riders. To create this, ride and show engineering were brought in so that they could bring this idea to life. The biggest problem for developers was how to make the huge, life-sized models of the sharks to move through the water with perfect timing, so that their movements coincided with those of the boats. The sharks would need to swim 20 feet per second, grab the boat, and then drag it around the seven-acre lagoon, and each shark weighed about three tons each, measured 24 feet, and had to move through the water with a thrust equivalent to that of a Boeing 747 engine. To enable this, nearly 2,000 miles of electrical wire and 7,500 tons of steel were part of the lagoon's construction. In addition, computer-guided hydraulic systems were used to control the actions of the sharks. The ride's finale would see the shark blown into thousands of tiny pieces after the boat's skipper would fire a grenade into its mouth, sending shark chunks up into the air. This all sounded amazing. But sadly, the ride was not working perfectly, and on the park's opening, it was a complete mess, having almost daily ride evacuations until Universal realized that the problems were so severe that there were no quick fixes for it. And less than three months after the park's opening, Jaws was closed completely to undergo a significant overhaul that would reportedly take a year. But this was not the case. Universal had to push back the reopening of the ride to 1992 and then to 1993. They brought in many companies like the Totally Fun Company and Oceaneering International so they could completely redesign the ride from scratch. And it was completely worth it. Jaws the Ride finally reopened in August 1993. But even then, it was officially categorized as undergoing technical rehearsals until early 1994. The ride had two major scene changes, but the rest remained basically the same. Guests loved it instantly, and from its opening in 1993 to 2005, the ride operated smoothly year-round. But in January 2005, Jaws was temporarily shut due to the rising cost of petrol. During this particular time, Orlando's theme parks were suffering from low attendance, so attractions like Jaws, which needed lots of fuel to be running, were very expensive to keep. So in December of that same year, Jaws opened again, and Universal decided to turn it into a seasonal ride that would open only when crowd levels demanded it. This went on until February 2007. The holiday season ended, and Jaws didn't close again, and Universal announced that it would be open full-time again. But then, in December 2011, it was announced that Jaws would close the following month to make room for a new attraction. The ride closed forever on January 2nd, 2012, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter had opened back in 2010 at Universal's Islands of Adventure, and it was a huge success. So rumors began to circulate that the Jaws ride would be occupied by a second Harry Potter land, and the rumors were right. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Diagon Alley, opened on the site in 2014. And while this new expansion is mind-blowing for Harry Potter fans everywhere, we can't help but feel sad that such a classic and amazing ride like Jaws was closed. Jaws on Fire 2001. With the 21st century coming, Universal wanted to upgrade the Jaws experience to get with the times, and they saw that this particular sequence lacked special effects, so they decided that they would add fire effects to the attraction. So after a two-week rehab, including draining the lagoon and removing a few props, May 30th, 2000 saw the day that the Jaws attack became Jaws on Fire. For this new experience, George the Fisherman was removed and replaced by an Amity police diver. Also, a few boats from Jaws 2 were dragged out of a shed and used as set dressing for the Cabot Cove Amity Island facade. 
The new sequence takes the tram into the peaceful Amity seaside town. The shark has been caught, and there's a strong police presence to make sure there are no problems. But suddenly, we see a shark in the water. So maybe they caught the wrong shark. The shark attacks the police diver, and it's too late for him to get back to his boat. Guess hope that the shark will take as bait a big yellow buoy that's attached to the dock. And it does, and begins pulling it away from the tram. But he also pulls the dock. The dock used to tilt, nearly plunging the tram guests into the water. And it looks like it's ruptured the gas line too. The whole dock is catching fire. Before guests know what's happening, the shark attacks. This upgrade is pretty cool. Sadly, in 2010, the dock tilting mechanism stopped working. The tilt helped all visitors on the far side of the tram to get a good view of the shark and also added to the peril of the situation. But in 2014, the lake was drained to create a completely solid roadway for the tram. Still, this new sequence is fantastic. And while we hope Universal can fix the dock issue, we love this part of the classic tram tour. And we hope it stays this way for many years to come. Jaws the Ride, Japan, 2001. The last animatronic created from this franchise was the one made for the Jaws ride in Universal Studios Japan. The ride is practically identical to the one in Orlando. It opened back in 2001 and thankfully continues to operate to date. One of the main differences in this ride compared to the one in Orlando is the animatronics. The design of these specific animatronics is awe-inspiring and notorious. They are larger, have a much better texture, and a much more intimidating look. Also, they have more teeth which makes them scarier. Recently, the ride received an update, and the new animatronics were created by Edge Innovations. Edge Innovations was founded back in 1991 by Walt Conti, and they have successfully completed nearly 100 very impressive projects, including Emotep on the Mummy Ride, and more recently, the Indominus Rex on Jurassic Park the Ride. Hopefully, Universal Japan will never remove them so that they can continue Bruce's legacy. As you can see, the Jaws animatronics have really evolved and terrorized people from all over the world since 1976. And we're happy to say that Universal keeps creating awesome rides and animatronics, and you can check them out. So start planning your next vacation. Our friends at PixieVacations.com will help you plan your perfect vacation to Universal Studios Hollywood, Universal Studios Orlando, or Universal's Islands of Adventure, specifically tailored to your vacation style and budget. And working with a pixie is completely free. So talk with them to make the best out of your next theme park vacation.